current government response uh, to the housing crisis in the context of Australia's political economy uh, and maybe go in a little bit deeper about what the financialization of housing has meant uh, and as a result who has um, and wields an enormous amount of power in Australia's economy and why the government might be responding uh, in the way it is. Uh, and I think that gives us a good contour and understanding uh, of um, who we're fighting uh, and the sort of uh, why it's um, proven so difficult um, to convince uh, this um, federal Labor government to take the housing crisis at all seriously. Uh, and it's often strange because both federal, you know, given the domination of Labor at both the federal and state level at the moment, I think it's often strange and people have been confronted um, by um, just how aggressively um, Labor has rejected the sort of quite common sense solutions to the housing crisis. If we were going to pursue, for instance, a response that improved people's and working people's material lives. And I think what I want to argue is actually their response makes enormous sense if you understand their role um, as uh, uh, rep functionally um, playing the role of uh, returning the finance and property sector um, to uh, sort of a stable profitability uh, and uh, not, for instance, I would argue um, what they should be doing, um, which is representing the vast majority of people. So um, I might just share my screen. I don't know if this will work um, and just go, only go through three of these slides, not the whole thing, don't worry. Um, and I just wanted to first um, speak to what a few of the previous speakers have talked about, because I think for me, and you've probably seen me talk about this before, I think this sums up the entire housing crisis in Australia more than any other graph. Um, and what it shows is the proportion of bank lending in Australia um, that went to biz goes to business and goes to property. Uh, and you can see in the 1990s, the big green bar there, over 60% of all bank lending um, uh, went to business, whether it's small business, manufacturing, whatever it might be, and just over 20% um, went to housing and actually a very small slither of that went to investor housing. Now, as um, the pre previous speakers have spoken about, something massive changed in particular in the 1980s and 1990s uh, and um, the deregulation of our financial sector was a crucial one. Now, not only did we see the rise of negative gearing and capital gains tax concessions together, and I'll come back to that, uh, but what we also saw was a deregulation of the financial markets and a few things happened. There used to be a lot of rules around where banks could and couldn't lend to, for instance. Um, there also used to be restrictions on whether or not um, international financial institutions could operate in Australia and, and, and those were all removed. And the other thing that happened was the Australian government helped set up uh, uh, this thing called the secondary mortgage market. And all that meant was it allowed banks to bundle together mortgages and sell them and trade them on financial markets. Uh, and um, I think the other thing you saw around this time um, was uh, probably a controversial um, topic I won't get into too much, um, but um, a huge um, uh, prices and incomes accord deal between the Australian government and the trade union movement. And one of the crucial elements of that was agreeing to restrict um, wage uh, demands above inflation uh, uh, in exchange for an expansion of the social wage, which um, beyond a few things didn't really come. And what that meant was um, the so new social contract had to be, well, well, while we're gonna be suppressing your wages, what we can give you in return is a housing asset that can accumulate uh, in enormous value that you can borrow against and help offset um, your declining wages. Um, and um, what that happened as a result of this huge transfer of wealth and power, ultimately I would argue um, to the banking and financial sector. And you can see the way that changed all the way up to 2017, where now over 60% of all bank lending in Australia goes to housing and a larger and larger proportion of that goes to investor housing. Um, and actually internationally, Australia has the most financialized housing system in the world. Um, you can see compared, uh, this is uh, the total proportion of bank lending in uh, a variety of countries that goes to housing. And you can see Australia is um, uh, inauspiciously number one. Compare that to the USA, which you'd believe, you'd think after their their housing market collapsed, that they would have a huge financialized housing sector. It's actually less financialized um, than Australia's, um, the UK, Spain, a bunch of other those countries that got smashed by the housing crisis. Um, and suppose what I'm arguing is, um, Pat, I would argue that probably the two dominant forces of capital in Australia, are both the fossil fuel um, capital, but also the property finance nexus uh, uh, dominated by the Australian banking system. 
Uh, and obviously the way they wield political power is uh, under a variety of ways. But I would note, and it's interesting to note, that the head of Australia's Banking Association is a former Labor Premier, um, Anna Bly, um, if you want to think about the sort of connections um, uh, there. Um, and obviously the same thing we, so, and I want to argue that actually the decline, the, the cut in funding for public housing wasn't just this sort of shift in policy from a activist, sort of an active state to what we call an administrative state, which I think Zach was sort of pointing to that, um, you know, we have increasingly under, especially under neoliberal ideology, the idea that the state plays a purely administrative role in the economy and changing and tweaking regulations, but largely taking a back seat. But what the decline, aggressive decline in public housing, as you can see here, this is the proportion of public housing built in Australia um, uh, uh, per million people. And you can see the big decline, especially from about the 1990s and 1980s. And that blue line, by the way, is what the Housing Australia Future Fund will get us to, which is below what we're currently doing. Um, but don't, don't get me started on the Housing Australia Future Fund. Um, uh, um, we'll be here all day. Um, but I suppose what I argue is that it was also this part of broader process of transferring wealth and power to the property and finance sector um, and um, creating this new sort of process of wealth accumulation um, and profit accumulation for the Australian economy. Uh, and to give you an idea of how powerful it is, Australia's, as Zach was mentioning, Australia's GDP, which is about $1.5 trillion. The total value of Australian property right now uh, is $10 trillion. So the total value of Australia's property market is over six times greater than Australia's total GDP. If you want to give an idea of just how important this sector is to the banking, property and finance sector. And so um, I think once we take all of that into context, actually Labor's response to the housing crisis makes an enormous amount of sense. Because what is happening at the moment is that we are seeing this um, crisis uh, of social reproduction, or for lack of a better term, basically household formation. There's a much greater proportion of people struggling to pay their rent, struggling to pay their mortgage. That creates a, starts to create a social crisis, which uh, uh, what we've seen in response um, is this dual response from both Labor and Liberal governments, but also from the property sector, this pincer movement. And the pincer movement basically comes down to, they argue, the problem is supply. Now, under, the, under that blanket, what they've done is use that as an ex, uh, excuse to sell off, aggressively sell off more public housing. Uh, and uh, what they, in a way, they're not, while that's completely wrong, obviously, that the supply of private housing will do anything to solve the housing crisis. Um, there's a grain of truth in what they're actually arguing is, well, we've started to see a big decline in um, the approval of private dwellings. And while banks are starting to make record profits, um, their long-term profitability is slightly threatened actually um, by um, the instability in Australia's housing market. So what they're doing actually is freeing up all this public land, selling it off for cheap, um, uh, and uh, essentially providing a, another huge wave of subsidies to the um, private property market to help ensure their long-term profitability. Um, and that's who they're actually responding to. And I think that makes enormous sense when you think about how much power the banking and property and finance sector um, wields uh, in Australia. Um, and I, maybe I'll just finish on this. Zach mentioned that half a trillion dollars. Well, if you want to get an idea of the federal government's um, priorities in the housing crisis, um, the total cost of all tax concessions to property investors over the next 10 years, uh, uh, that includes negative gearing, capital gains tax concessions. Uh, if you don't know, also um, what's called positive gearing, where even where a property investor actually makes a profit on their investment property, they can still write off their mortgage, mortgage interest payments off on their tax. Um, like, so we talk about negative gearing, there's also positive gearing. So um, they actually get a little extra profit as well. The total cost of all of those tax concessions over the next 10 years, not 30 years, 10 years, will be over half a trillion dollars. It'll be $33 billion in this financial year alone. Now that's egregious, but what I would argue those are is a half a trillion dollar tax concession, not just to property investors, but they're a stimulus payment into the economy to ensure that the financialization of housing continues apace. That's what those payments are going to. And then the final number I'll leave you with is over the last 10 years from 2014 to just over part 2023. So um, taking in that year before, the total private rent pay by renters across Australia was $440 billion. 
in rent. If you're a renter like me and you're paying that, you've contributed to close to half a trillion dollars of rent that was transferred from renters to property investors and ultimately to the banking and finance industry. Um, and um, why I highlight that is because I think ultimately that's, I would argue, how we view all of this context because it's frustrating and weird to confront and have to make these arguments and point out that there's a housing crisis and point out actually all of the evidence suggests that the ideal solution is caps and freezes on rents, mass investment in public and affordable housing, uh, removing those tax concessions. But when you're arguing with political institutions um, that actually don't, that their primary focus is not that, um, then I think you start to understand why they, for instance, just completely ignored those arguments. And I think what that really leaves us with is how do we build social power in a way that confronts that? And this is why I think that ultimately um, the other unstalled story of post-World War II Australia is 55% of the country rented post-World War II. Uh, and I think as you know, now over 30% of the country rents and a growing proportion of um, mortgage holders are also being screwed over by this housing system. We're getting close again to a social majority and a social coalition that I think could overcome that um, economic uh, power held by the financial and property industry. But it's going to take a broad campaign that doesn't just involve building public housing where we broaden the criteria to middle income people as well and build it in that European style way that's beautifully designed and built. That, but it also includes fighting for a freezing cap on rent increases and scrapping those uh, financial and uh, tax concessions for property investors. Um, but thanks for having me and I'm really looking forward to participating the rest of the day. Thank you.